Welcome everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to see so many people here today. Um, I'll have to refer to my notes, so please excuse me. But um, my name is Rabina Redknapp. I'm currently the Acting Executive Director of Nursing and Office for Mental Health, and I have the pleasure of being your chair today. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Nujuk people, um, and I'd like to pay respect to Elders past and present, and offer my acknowledgement and respect to the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present. We're very grateful today to have Angela Rabbit, Senior Policy Advisor from the Mental Health Commission, representing the Honourable Roger Cook, who couldn't make it today. Um, welcome, Angela. Ms. Angela. Hi, Angela. <laughs> um, do you know Marin Uchi? Is that how? Is that the Marin Uchi? Marin Uchi. No. Gino. 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 It's okay. Not yet. I'm not talking about that one. Um, uh, hopefully he will be joining us then, and he's also here um, to honour um, Roger Cook, who couldn't be here, so welcome Gina when he arrives. So today's event is the result of a lot of joint planning between the Council Foundation, Council, Council, Cancer Council of WA, together with the East, North, South and um, WAC. So it's, it's been a lot of work put in today, I know a lot of people have been working really hard, and there's been a number of presentations across the state. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Ashley Reid, who's the CA of the Council of WA, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but he does send his apologies. I'd now also like to extend a special welcome to you all, including those people joining us via um, video conference. Can everybody hear me that's on BC? Can you give me the thumbs up if you can? Oh, look at all those waves. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we hope that today's seminar will ignite a drive to, smoke, to, to get smoking cessation and policy on the agenda across mental health services. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping points. This dangly thing up here is the microphone, and I'm told it's extremely sensitive. So if you have to cough or um, ruffle papers, we just need to maybe need, need to get you to leave the room if that's the case. Um, so the toilets, for those of you who don't know this building, the toilets are located at the end of Gascoigne House, which are towards John the 23rd. So you have to go out this way, that way, and the toilets are along the, the corridor over there. If we do have a fire, the evacuation meeting point is in the Gascoigne House car park, which is in the northern side of the building. So follow me if we have a fire, and I'll show you where it is. Okay. You'll see along the side of the wall here, we've got a resource stand. Um, this includes resources provided by Jane Chambers and Jennifer Boyle, who are both CNSs of the Sir Charles Gardner Mental Health Unit, who will also be presenting a case study for us today. That case study will be called Transitioning to a Smoke-Free Environment and Incorporating Smoking and Support Providers as Part of a Clinical Therapy Program. So the resources include materials when used when talking with patients about smoking, um, Jane has also very kindly provided her master's project poster, which is related to her presentation. Um, the resource stand will also include things like the copies of the forms for staff who are smokers to access NRT, so that is still available for those of you that aren't aware of that. And I encourage you all to have a look at this stand before you leave today. So again, welcome to those people joining us via BC. Can I please ask you that when you're not um, talking to us that you put your mute buttons on? Um, and if you have questions, please just hold them to the end of the, the um, presentations and we'll have a question time. So just a reminder, the session is being recorded by Telehealth. We'll have 15 minutes set aside at the end of the session for questions. And as I said, just hold your questions until then if you can, but jot them down so you don't forget them because we really encourage those questions. So why is today important? Smoking continues to place an enormous burden on the WA health system. Smoking prevalence may have declined over the past decade, but rates are still very high among Aboriginal people, those living in low socioeconomic areas, those who experience mental illness, and those with problematic AOD use, and those at risk of homelessness. Tobacco continues to cause the greatest burden of disease in Australia. In 2015, statistics were rather frightening. 83,941 hospital bed days due to tobacco, due to tobacco either active or passive smoking, um, across the age spectrum were um, prevalent, with 19,150 hospitalisation, again across all ages, which were due to tobacco, either passive or active smoking. This equates to 52 hospitalisations a day in WA alone. 
Overall, June 2015, 1,785 deaths resulted um, that were directly attributed to, to active and passive smoking. Research tells us that 32% of all smokers are living with mental illness, and about 70% of people living with schizophrenia and bipolar are smokers. We also face the additional complexity with the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in our patients, which range from 24 to 53%. This is directly related to illnesses such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, both of which we know can be caused or exacerbated through smoking, leading to premature mortality in our patients. The literature actually tells us that those individuals diagnosed with mental illness die between 10 to 25 years younger than the general population. I'm not sure that anyone would agree that that's acceptable. 78% of deaths of people living with mental illness are directly attributed to poor physical health care and physical comorbidity. It's imperative that we make the physical health of our consumers a priority. The research is there, the everyday solutions are there. We just need to adopt these into our everyday practice and help reduce the life expectancy gap we currently see. So tackling tobacco and mental health settings is one avenue to reduce the adverse health effects that smoking can cause. We all have a duty of care to protect not only our patients, but also our staff and visitors from exposure to cigarette smoke. We know that this can be achieved by good clinical management for patients who smoke, as well as strong and clear communication about our smoke-free policy, an appropriate application, monitoring and adherence to the principles. We also need appropriate support for staff who smoke. A smoke-free policy and approach to smoking cessation is consistent with hospital values and can play a vital role in broader tobacco control efforts for the community. However, its implementation and application is often faced with many challenges, and I know many of you that work particularly on this site see that every day. During today's seminar, we hear from smoking cessation expert Emma Dean from Alfred's Health. Welcome, Emma. Emma will present the evidence on the connection between tobacco and mental health and the effectiveness of providing brief intervention to all patients who smoke. She will then present on best practice approaches to embed smoking sensation in mental health settings, including the evidence of pharmacotherapy therapies for supporting smoking sensation, as well as smoking and clinical aggression. However, before I invite Emma to come up, I'd like to use this opportunity to share a local case study from at the Mental Health Unit at the Child Gardner Hospital, which will be presented by the two CNSs, Jane Chambers and Jennifer Boyle. Jane's been working at the Child Gardner Mental Health Unit for the past eight years, providing alcohol, tobacco and other drug support to patients who live with both mental illness and substance use problems. During this time, she's graduated from the University of Notre Dame with a Master's in Nursing by Research in 2017. This was a mixed methods exploratory study on the attitudes and commitment of mental health professionals to treating tobacco addiction in the context, context of an acute inpatient mental health unit transitioning to a newly completed smoke-free mental health service. Jane is a credentialed drug and alcohol nurse with the Drug and Alcohol Nurses Australasia and also works tutoring in research methods and evidence-based practice to nursing students at the University of Notre Dame in Fremantle. Jennifer has been working in the area of co-occurring mental health and substance issues for 11 years. Um, her areas are inpatient detoxification, outpatient case management, and is currently working as an acting CNS in co-occurring inpatient mental health acute care at the Sir Charles Gardner Mental Health Unit. She has a postgraduate diploma in mental health nursing, diploma of counselling, and is currently completing a Cert four in addiction studies for health professionals from the University of Tasmania. She is a member of the Australian College of Mental Health Nurses and Drug and Alcohol Nurses Australasia, including being a previous member on their conference committee. Can I please ask you to welcome Jane and Jennifer. Yes, I'm Jane, and this is my colleague Jen. And um, probably since about 2014, we've really been trying to tackle tobacco in the mental health unit. And that the transition from D20 to a new mental health unit is probably a good motivation to do that. So what we've done is put together a little bit of a, a case study, which is, I suppose it represents, um, it's not a singular process, tackling tobacco in mental health settings. And it's been very much a combination of you know, teamwork between you know, management, clinical, clerical, and it's a very dynamic, at times complex, polarising process. So 
we're just going to be talking for the next 10 minutes and then we'll have five minutes for question time. I think that's our time slot. And I know that we haven't captured everything, but um, just a little bit of a snapshot. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. I know some of this might also be covered in the rest of the morning, but just a bit of a, a background that, um, as we know, smoking rates among people with a mental illness are two to three times more prevalent than general population, and that it's a significant risk factor that's preventable. Um, and that also when you look at inpatients in a hospital setting, mental health patients also have a really high prevalence of smoking. And there's different um, statistics that are sort of bandied around, but they're, say, like people with, living with schizophrenia, bipolar, um, they also you know, have high rates, 70, up to 70%. Um, and things like if, compared to non-smokers, there's like fourfold rates of depression. Um, so D20 was a 36-bed voluntary mental health unit and as all of the other services in hospitals, it was under the WA smoke free policy. And then what had happened with that, a lot of the services in mental health exercise the exemption for patients under the Mental Health Act. But what sort of that often translated to in a clinical setting was that there was a permissive smoking norm, <coughs> ongoing management and clinical issues about that. And some of those issues were things like default smoking courtyards, um, high rates of smoking by patients who weren't necessarily under the Mental Health Act, not using nicotine replacement therapy, um, passive smoking and smoke drift concerns, complaints about all the environmental tobacco smoke issues, cigarette butts, there was nighttime smoking related behavioural issues. And I think sort of um, that you know that's sort of fairly typical with a lot of other mental health services that's been documented. You know, Australia is quite similar to the UK and in the United States and other European um, countries. So the transition to the new unit occurred in August 2015. So our role with drug and alcohol nurses that started in about 2010, and that FTE has sort of grown over that time, and. Our sort of mandate was doing individual and group work support, and that includes smoking. Drug and alcohol sector, like the mental health sector, also neglects tobacco. So we also recognised that we weren't always tackling tobacco, that we sort of alcohol, methamphetamine, cannabis was sort of like we put them up as the priorities, and we say, oh, we've got to ask if they were smokers. So. Once we started sort of doing probably more QIs around this area and focusing on it, we noticed that there was tobacco actually has become our number one substance on all our stats. So with the statewide standardised clinical documentation, um, the smokers get identified through the PMR6, which is that NRT assessment form. Um, and then part of our role has also been like looking at those audits because what can happen is that it's not necessarily that screening isn't always the compliancy levels that can be variable. We also try to include tobacco support in the solace care planning to try and capture it. And sort of our role is also around sort of education and support of patients and staff. So just as an example, with our this was just to capture that. Um, when we sort of, I first started in the role, like tobacco is way down the bottom in 2013, and when we actually started really trying to capture tobacco on our referral forms, it increased. And then that dip down in 2015 is actually in that transition period because there was just, just in that turnover, we had sort of patient rates were lowered before that we transitioned. But actually, and then it's sort of like steadily gone back up. So that's um, nicotine use. So these are all our the people that we see who also have a they've got like a substance use issue and tobacco. But it's also we also see people who don't have a substance use issue and a mental illness or their substance use is tobacco. That's sort of mixed in amongst those stats. But it fits in around for that 35 
up to 40% mark, which is sort of consistent with um, literature and what other <coughs> health services around the country and other countries report. So as you can appreciate, tackling um, tobacco is a complex issue with many variables. Um, so in order to actually um, move over to the new unit and uh, support the clients and the staff for a smoke-free unit, we um, did some quality improvement initiatives. Um, so the first one there is ongoing uh, tobacco strategy for compliance uh, for a smoke-free policy. Um, so that entails... Which one is it? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> what we actually did was um, the service implemented a smoke-free working party which consist consisted of a um, multidisciplinary team and consumer consultant inclusion as well. Uh, we uh, had a departmental forum um, with the staff prior to the transition to discuss the issue and ways of um, um, going about it. So we also provided information to consumer groups, services and staff, including quit and NRT support. Um, increased, as you saw in the statistics, identification of smokers and nicotine replacement support. Um, education to staff, which you know included the ask, assess, advise, arrange, um, assist, and arrange information, um, supporting client, um, staff in addressing that with clients, and uh, nicotine replacement therapy, um, medication interaction education to consumers, um, carers, and staff as well, and uh, increased brief. Um, intervention and other time intervention which is as family. So um, on the board um, we obviously did individual and do individual support to clients one to one. We do facilitate groups on the board as well. Those um, groups fluctuate in attendance um, and so we, we find that individual is probably the best we find them. <laughs> we often use our group time for um, if they, no one comes, and we we'll often go and find patients who are outside smoking or something, <laughs> and yes. take the smokalyzer and engage assertive engagement. Yep. So yeah, the smokalyzer is a good tool for um, motivation. So people finding that they the less they smoke, the less they um, have oxyhemoglobin level is. Um, so nicotine replacement therapy. Tomorrow's well no tobacco day, so we actually hold a stall tomorrow with just the disease lung and just information and um, <coughs> support to to consumers and their carers and staff. So um, we support people one to one in terms of managing the stress around not being able to smoke, particularly in the secure unit, um, and continue that throughout their admission. Um, yeah, education regarding smoking and medication, and once again, family inclusion, education and support. So that, this relates to the first QI, obviously. This is you. Yeah. Yeah. my glasses. Now. <laughs> so this second QI started actually once we moved into the new unit and it was getting consumer feedback about it being a completely smoke free unit, even on the so for patients under the Mental Health Act on the secure side, and that's like there is no access to a smoking cage or any, or any sort of exemption. So we got their feedback between December 2016 and March 2017. Um, we had 41 patients who gave feedback, no carers provided feedback, which is a shame, but um, we sort of get anecdotal feedback. Sometimes that we, we actually had more patients giving us feedback, but they didn't want to fill the form in. So um, that's just, I suppose how it goes. In. Um, the majority of the people of those 41, they were smokers. So what they reported back is that what 75%, 79% were offered NRT. 80%, 83 of them said they did use NRT during their admission. They predominantly distraction activities were considered the most helpful. 58. 
percent so they plan to quit or cut down the place position. And then the open-ended comments showed like have dominant themes around increased stress and difficulty with the key withdrawals, withdrawals, choice and rights. Um, and to a lesser extent themes related to the benefits of a smoke-free admission and forced abstinence. <coughs> we did find though that sometimes the people who actually reported increased distress and stress about completely not smoking on the Karajini side, when they came over to the open side, they actually wanted to continue cutting down their smoking or stay stopped. And they were reported positive, they were much more positive about that once they, as they were getting better. But we couldn't always encourage them to capture that in the feedback forms. So some of the open-ended comments, so I've just tried to fit it in the theme that sort of is pretty typical for mental health services. So often one of the concerns about when services go completely smoke-free is that increased mental health acuity. And yep, some of them said like one of them was being someone that has had issues with mental health for the last 18 years. I'm finding it very hard to cope with not being able to smoke in a locked ward. Patients have a lot more issues to deal with and to take the cigarettes away makes me stress more. Um, someone else said the humili humiliating way I behaved just to have a cigarette. I became aware I was prepared to do anything just to have a cigarette. Um, that was just about some of the activities and all the they had all the things that we sort of offer or what might help with their quitting smoking and distraction activities definitely came up as hands down winner. Um, yeah, I mean, and that they used NRT but didn't necessarily see it as that helpful. But I don't, sometimes I think that can sometimes be, they don't realise that actually the nicotine withdrawal aren't as bad as they might be without the nicotine patch. But we've noticed that definitely the secure unit, since the unit has been <coughs> completely smoke free, the, the staff are excellent in terms of the whole NRT is very consistent and um, patients get off of that very quickly. Some more open-ended comments. That must have been a bit, sorry, switched around the wrong way, but... <laughs> another one in terms of the increased mental health security. I found that being a smoker and the stress that it caused um, me not being able to smoke made the situation that I was going through to be extremely exacerbated and this caused me to become suicidal and feel unsafe. Um, I tried smoking in my last two admissions because basically everyone was smoking. It seemed like the social thing to do. This place needs a smoking cage for one at a time. It is ridiculous to make people give up. It's a personal choice. And being given a choice on open unit it helps me to control my smoking rather than it control me. So what happens on there, once people are on the voluntary side, they actually can, if they've got leave, go out into the public space and smoke. Um, I enjoyed the atmosphere at Kajini Ward where cigarette smoking was easier to give up, fabulous and fresh. I've had a lesson in self-realisation and self-awareness while in hospital. After 42 years of smoking, I want to become an ex-smoker. We actually see quite, that is quite a consistent theme. It's not always captured in this um, consumer feedback QI, but we get so much um, here, a lot of positive anecdotal. They might have sort of, even someone who was saying they felt suicidal at the beginning might be someone who comes into our smoking support group once they're better and actually is glad that they've had this opportunity. Um, benefits of smoke free, I'm a non-smoker. During my stay it was good to see the environment free from cigarette butts and smells. The air was fresh and having a non-smoking policy in place means people who are smokers can literally interact well with non-smokers. If this was not the case you would also be dealing with isolation on the wards because in the past I have observed clear division. So those 41 people definitely captured those main themes that mental health services see from consumers. So we just sort of put as our recommendations from that quality improvement was that a completely smoke free unit should continue to provide a combination of resources and supports that include drug and alcohol nurses who can provide support and education accessible to both patients and staff in relation to tobacco, nicotine or tobacco <coughs> addiction. Um, the use of NRT and distraction self-soothing activities should be a consistent and integral part of services offering, offered to inpatients who smoke and further quality improvement initiative related to consumer and carer feedback and evaluation of best practice for use of resources and support. So I know we also do support consumers and their families who 
they really want to quit and the families actually talk to us about how to get support. And actually MIFWA, the Mental Illness Fellowship of WA, they actually for, they do run a um, some good groups for people who've also got you know, that severe mental illness and um, just getting that support around all the wellness things that are very well with someone trying to stop smoking. And I mean, families have said back to us that they want their loved one who say they've got a chronic mental illness, a chronic smoker, to be able to cut down and stop. Me too. Yes, oh, I can do it. Okay. Yep. Um, so we're also currently completing, in the process of completing another quality improvement initiative at the mental health observa observation area, which is a six bed um, <coughs> unit adjunct to ED, a short stay unit. So patients come straight from ED into the mental health observation area and they often experience nicotine withdrawal, so they've not been able to smoke while in ED um, or go out to the non-smoking area on the hospital. Um, so, and they're not necessarily <coughs> always in the rush giving information or, or it's picked up by the nursing staff, particularly at some stage, about their nicotine withdrawal. So um, we're in the process of actually uh, handing out information and we're gonna collect some feedback about that. So what we do is um, educate the clients, so just as we do down at the mental health unit, um, and, and do the five A's again. And so we're in process of that right now. And you can see that information, some of that information is in, available in the um, table, the display table. And I think that brings us to a close. I'll just suppose one other thing I'd like to say is that um, we, we actually do have an impact on the staff as well. We have had some staff members say that um, because of dialoguing with us and um, engaging with us over a period of time that some of them have given up smoking, so that's terrific, isn't it? Um, okay, do you want to say something again? Yeah. Just, um, so when I did my Masters, like last year, we didn't run the World No Tobacco Store because we were both at the Drug and Alcohol Nurses Conference, so I presented my Masters over there, and just need to acknowledge the um, Office of the Chief Nurse gave me a $4,000 grant while I was doing my study to support that this is such a good cause. And also, like, Cancer Council have been fantastic in their support of us trying to sort of like that tackling tobacco. We still, um, that service, like all the resources that we can give to consumers, um, their project officers have helped us with, there was a Queensland mental health unit that had also gone completely smoke-free, so some of their information. So, yeah, thanks, Cancer Council. You've been a great support too. Thank you. Thank you. Really great. It's really good to see such um, great initiatives being undertaken. I think for me, the resounding um, messages in those presentations was that tackling tobacco is everybody's business. It's just not one discipline, it's not one nurse, it's not one doctor, and it's not one other staff member. Um, it needs to be a multidisciplinary approach in consultation with the consumers. Um, and it needs to be multi-dimensional. The, the key messages about needing support, education, distraction, exercise, and that family inclusion, I think is really, really important. What I thought was really interesting was that the high percentage of um, consumers that were offered NRT, there was a high percentage that actually took it up, which is interesting. I think people often presume that it won't work, so we don't offer. Um, and for me, that it's the start of the journey to maybe reduce or see um, smoking while you're in hospital. So thank you, that was great. So now I'd like to welcome Emma. Um, Emma currently holds the position of Acting Population Health and Health Promotion Coordinator and also leads and the also, is also the lead pharmacist smoke free within Alfred Health. Emma has over 15 years of experience working within the Victorian health sector, including roles spanning leadership, population health, research and clinical pharmacy. Emma has been integral in driving multidisciplinary system change to ensure the effective clinical management of nicotine dependency at Alfred, Hos Alfred Health and more recently across Victoria. She has well-recognised expertise in the area of smoking cessation and related pharmacotherapies and is a member of the Royal Australian <coughs> College of General Practitioners Expert Advisory Group for Smoking Cessation. Emma is frequently involved in teaching and training healthcare professionals. 
She focuses on delivering the most up-to-date, evidence-based knowledge and the sharing of her extensive practical experience in working with clients who achieve smoking cessation. We're very lucky to have Emma here today and to share her expertise and welcome Emma. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for having me. I did want to declare that I, I have no conflicts of interest. I'm not paid by the pharmaceutical industry, um, which is a common question I get asked, particularly um, you know, being a pharmacist and, and having an interest in smoking cessation. So I just really wanted to touch on a little bit about Alfred Health to begin with and to share our journey, uh, which hasn't always been uh, smooth sailing in this space. So we're a big major metro health service. Uh, we see about 110,000 patients through our doors every year that are admitted, um, and we have another 106,000 uh, presentations to our emergency department. We do a lot of surgeries. Uh, we're a statewide service for, for transplantation, HIV, um, and we have a, a large mental health um, unit as well, as well as an age mental health unit within uh, a couple of our campuses. We're also a really big employer, and that was important for us to recognise when we looked at our approach to smoke free. So the top left hand picture here is our main courtyard within the Alfred Health campus. And you can see there in, in that top left hand picture that it had quite a large prominent quite comfortable looking smoking designated smoking area. Um, and that's what it looked like back in 2007 and early 2008. Really pleased to show what it looks like now. But we went smoke free in, in 2008, and this was pre any legislation in Victoria for health services being smoke free. We had a CEO at the time who was all about doing things really quickly. She was actually nicknamed Nike because her mantra was get on and just do it. So we were given three months to go from having designated smoking areas, non-compliance pretty much uh, with, with those areas, people were still smoking on site, um, to being completely smoke free. So our objectives at these, this time, in retrospect when we look at this, are, are really quite narrow. We wanted to be a public leader, we wanted to reduce exposure to passive smoke, but at, at this point that's all that was part of our approach. So our actions were around putting together a really great policy, communicating it and putting up some signs. So when you looked at actually what happened, well, not really a whole lot. We had high awareness because there was a buzz around the health service, structures were being torn down, we had signage going up, but we still had a whole lot of issues with compliance, both staff and patients smoking on site, and we had unchanged clinical practice. So we weren't doing a whole lot at this point to support our patients or our work workforce to, who smoked to either manage their dependency and make them more comfortable while they're in a smoke-free environment or to support cessation. So in 2011, we actually had a mental health client take Alfred Health to the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, so a legal challenge. So she cited an infringement of her human rights to not be able to smoke in a health service while she was an involuntary patient. So this event shook Alfred Health's commitment to being smoke free. We had a different CEO at this time and there was actually a point where we were getting quotes to put up designated smoking areas again. But the type of CEO that we had at this point, who's still our current CEO, uh, was able to, to challenge the executive and our board and we actually went through with this legal challenge. The outcome was that VCAT upheld our right to be a smoke-free health service, that there wasn't a human right to smoke. Human rights only extend as far as that they don't impact on other people. So with the significant health risks attributable to secondhand smoke, smoking wasn't going to be something particularly protected. But it was not okay for us as a health service to be smoke-free and not have a systematic, standardised approach to identifying our patients who smoked assessing their level of nicotine dependency and providing them support to cope or to quit. So in 2012, we relaunched our strategy. And you can see here that our objectives are much broader. We still want to reduce exposure to passive smoke. We still want to be seen as a public leader. But now we also want to facilitate smoking cessation among our patients and our employees. And we also want to recognise that as a health service, there are going to be patients where we're going to need to be just managing their temporary abstinence. That quitting is just something that's not on their agenda. And when you think about that, it's a little bit like alcohol. As a health service, if patients are heavy drinkers, 
We're not going to hand them over a six pack of beer and send them out the front of the hospital to, to drink it. We're going to identify their risk of alcohol withdrawal. We're going to manage that, but we also want to be pro-cessation as well. We want to help them uh, make those, those improvements to their health. One of our other objectives was around denormalising smoking. This might sound a little bit bizarre, particularly the prevent uptake. But we had evidence that we had clients coming in to our mental health facility, particularly non-smokers and leader smokers. So for us as an organisation, that was something we felt really strongly about. And we also recognise that the, when we have patients and staff within our health service, a lot of them have quit smoking. So we wanted to reduce the risk of them relapsing. And we know that some of the biggest drivers of people relapsing back to smoking is seeing other people smoke or smelling that cigarette smoke. So our objectives at this time were much broader. We were looking at this holistically. We were looking at all the components. We were looking at the environment, we were looking at the clinical interactions, and we were also looking at our workforce. So this time our actions were still around communication, still around reviewing policy, using social media, internet, intranet to, to communicate what we were doing. And we also framed something which we call the clinical management and nicotine dependency bit long-winded, um, but effectively what we had to do is we had to put this on the radar of our clinicians. So our clinicians were thinking, oh, smoking is a public health issue or it's an oh and issue. So we had to frame this particular part of our smoke-free approach clinically to engage our clinicians. Okay, it's a dependency, just like alcohol dependency, drug dependency, we need to do something about it. And that was supported by a really robust clinical guideline. And we had amazing input from all our heads of units. So uh, within, within a couple of months, um, I had to meet with you know, the head of plastics and trauma, um, Gen Med, uh, to really engage them in, in what we were doing in this space. And we had fantastic input from them. Again, it had to be supported by education. And that education had to be delivered in means that were already there. So there was no way I was going to be able to deliver face-to-face -face education to 8,000 staff at Alfred Health. It just wasn't going to happen. So it was about what were our opportunities, what were those leverage points. So having a huge nursing workforce, they use a lot of online learning. So together with our nursing education team and with approval from our nursing executive, we developed education for nurses with nurses. The same with our medical team. We looked at introducing it within standardised within our orientation to the hospital. And also one of the, the most effective things we found was the use of grand rounds within the health service where you get all different types of clinicians together. Um, we would often do panels, invite consumers along uh, as part of our approach to education. So what happened this time round? Still had high awareness, but interestingly we had increased compliance, so less smoking on our site and less smoking around our campus perimeter, even though we weren't focusing as much on it. And we were achieving best practice for clinical management, as all health services would. So what was different? What was different this time round? Well, certainly I think the legal challenge definitely uh, was one of those things that, that made us review what we were doing. But we had strong organisational leadership. Now, in Victoria, we're quite lucky uh, as a major metro health service. They're actually mandated by the Health Act to have what we call a primary care and population health board subcommittee. So we actually had smoking as one of the, the health service priorities. So we had that board support. We had our CEO support. And it was around a problem that needed a solution. We communicated actively and publicly to the point where people would actually pull us up if there were issues, because it was expected that that's what we were doing. We were a smoke-free health service. And our CEO is very much known for his approach to not try and get everyone to support what he, he wants, but he frames it as, how can we not? Can anyone in this room argue with me to say that as a leading health service, where smoking is the leading cause of preventable death and disease, that we should not be taking this seriously? So it's changing that, that dialogue around. One of the other enablers for us was really strong clinical leadership. We committed to best practice, we allocated resources, both people and pharmaceutical, and we made sure we had support for patients and we had support for staff. And it was always with a continuous improvement focus. We knew this was going to be a long-term effort. And 10 years later, we're still working. Um, and we needed to measure our performance. And evidence of a problem does not mean a failure. And uh, there was a couple of meetings that I was at yesterday um, and I was kind of putting it in the perspective of things like hand hygiene and flu vaccination. We don't often get 100% compliance, 
but then we don't say, oh, well, we're not going to bother doing it anymore. But for some reason, when it comes to smoke-free health service, if we see one person smoking on site, we're all very, very uh, quick to say, oh, well, it's not working, it's a failure, maybe we shouldn't do it anymore. And for us, we wanted to always innovate and test new approaches with a safe-to-fail type of uh, mentality. So with our clinical leadership, we found that it was really important for us as a large health service to have clearly defined clinical leadership. So what, what, what had happened previously when you talked to clinicians was everyone else thought everyone else was having the conversation. You talk to your doctors, they think the nurses were doing it. You talk to the nurses, they thought the doctors were doing it. So in effect, it wasn't happening. And our performance was poor. About 14% of the time back in 2011 that we were asking people about smoking and providing any type of support. Not really a, a, okay for a, for a leading health service. We needed to make sure that our clinical model, how these conversations were happening, the delivery of brief intervention was integrated within existing practice. Number one, because there was no way I was going to be able to convince our CEO to give me a whole lot of cash. But number two, to also ensure that this was sustainable into the future and it was embedded in what we did. The process had to be systematic. Every person, every time, especially in those areas of greatest challenges particularly within our HIV unit, within our mental health unit, those areas where we know that smoking prevalence is high. We have to measure our performance. So one of the things about it being a health service priority is that you have that support, but you've got to give them evidence that you're actually doing something. So we looked at ways that we could measure performance, particularly in the clinical space. We wanted to normalise practice. This was a part of what we do as health professionals we looked at minimising risk for disease. So we needed to incorporate smoking as part of our approach. And we wanted to emotionally compel health professionals. So the use of the consumer voice that we expect as patients to be asked about our smoking. And we expect to be provided support. Um, and the Start the Conversation campaign was a campaign that was funded by the Victorian government um, together with Alfred Health. Um, and it was a campaign that had that emotional angle to compel our clinicians to bring this up on their radar. So when I say the clinical management of nicotine dependency, what exactly do I mean? Well, for us, it was living our leadership or putting our leadership role with our clinical pharmacists. Now, this is a model that works for Alfred Health, but certainly there are models within Victoria where the clinical leadership sits with nursing or medical, and, and there's lots of health services through the state that have different models uh, that sit with a different discipline. But essentially, it's one discipline taking on, I suppose, the bulk of, uh, of the leadership in this space, supported by the rest of the multidisciplinary team. And in order for us to do that effectively, we wanted to ensure that clients were asked about their smoking, assessed, and provided a brief intervention to either cope while being in a smoke-free environment or to quit rapidly within admission to hospital. So for us, our pharmacists see patients within about 10 to 15 minutes of arriving in the ED and are part of the multidisciplinary team. So they actually round with our orthopaedic surgeons or our gen med physicians. So we actually allowed our pharmacists to prescribe nicotine replacement therapy and the appropriate education went with that. We also allowed our nurses to initiate nicotine replacement therapy and again, had the appropriate education to go with that. And when you think about that, um, you know, there's generally a list of nurse initiated meds in most health, most health services. And you've got to remember nicotine replacement therapy you can buy in the supermarket. That's how confident our therapeutic good administration is with its safety and efficacy, that you can actually buy it without, without talking to a health professional. And that was all underpinned by an algorithm, so a standardised process around having that conversation, assessing their level of dependency and what was evidence-based to offer them to help manage that dependency and minimise the withdrawal. We made a commitment as an organisation that we wanted to have all formulations of nicotine replacement therapy available. So that was quite a bit of discussion with our Drugs and Therapeutics Committee, a whole lot of evidence whole lot of cost analysis um, that we had to provide them, but we got that across the line with our strong uh, CEO support. And we also wanted to make it available on the impress. So if you think about people who smoke, they typically have a cigarette every hour, maybe a little bit more frequently. So by the time they've been in the ambulance or families brought them into hospital, they've been seen by the doctor and they're in a bed, they're actually going to be in withdrawal. So if there is a delay for that patient to have it prescribed by the doctor, then have it dispensed by the pharmacy and delivered to the patient, 
that significant delay can really throw that client into withdrawal and make them quite uncomfortable. And that's why it's not an unusual occurrence, certainly in Victoria, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago, that you'd see patients out the front of the emergency department in their towns, their IV poles, their catheter, whatever else they might have, having, having a cigarette smoke, um, because we haven't had that conversation early enough. We also recognise that as a health service, we've got lots of other opportunities with patients. So the opportunity around following discharge and making sure that we're communicating adequately back to primary care around patient smoking. Now we know that discharge communication generally is really difficult, um, but we actually created a mandatory field within our discharge communication around smoking. Stop Before the Op was an initiative where we looked at what we can do for patients that come into hospital that we know are coming to us for planned surgery and what we can do to start this conversation early before they arrive on the door of our emergency department. We also introduced an outpatient clinic for patients with uh, significant dependency and uh, uh, associated complexities. Um, so this clinic is kind of split in half. About half of the patients uh, have mental illness, AOD, um, and are at risk of homelessness. And the other half of the clinic are patients who need to qualify for things like home oxygen transplantation or having uh, quite significant surgeries. Um, so this clinic provides intensive face-to-face uh, -face support and best practice um, advice as well as medication um, to those clients and I'll, I'll show you the success of that in a moment. Uh, and for us, we also introduced the Good News for Smokers and <coughs> support for our staff who smoke to quit. So we've done all this. What, what are the outcomes? Well, I'm really, really pleased um, to say that the proportion of patients given advice and support to quit has risen from 14% back in 2011 to more than 95%, and that's been there for the last four and a half years. So that is done by retrospective auditing uh, where our clinical performance unit and our coding team produce random samples of you know, maybe a thousand patients um, and then uh, our research team will actually retrospectively audit to, to get those figures. And we also did some follow-up a couple of years ago and we had uh, quit rates of, um, of about 15 to 17%. So what we were able to say was that our patients are four times more likely to quit smoking than those who go to a health service where they're not provided any support to quit. So population-wise, if we were able to do this across health services, the impact that we would have would be massive. Stop Before the Op is one I'm particularly proud of. Um, and this was spearheaded by our Director of Anesthesia. And I suppose it just shows that when you start doing something in this space and you start getting a bit of momentum from outcomes, everyone else comes on board. They want to be a part of it. So he actually came to me and said, Emma, been overseas in the US, they're doing a whole lot in this space. It's, and uh, we had a cardiothoracic surgeon pr present on Monday night at one of the events. And, and the terminology is being used now called prehabilitation. So what can we do prior to surgery to improve the chances of that patient having you know, no complications in the most uneventful surgery? And when you think about this, this matters for health services because if patients smoke, they're more, more likely to have uh, decreased wound healing, extra days in the ICU, extra days on the ventilator, uh, more likely to have pneumonia and the significant costs that come with that to the organisation. So this was the embedding of a brief intervention within this setting, the provision of best practice medication and support, referral to things like Quitline, so no cost to the organisation, and we were able to quadruple the number of people who made a quit attempt. So again, it just shows you when you have these conversations, more than half thought, okay, I'll give quitting a go. And when we looked at quit rates on the day of surgery, about a quarter of patients had quit. Now these are biochemically verified results. So you heard the, the girls before talk about the smokalyzer, which is a great motivational tool, um, but we were able to use it to biochemically verify abstinence. Um, we were a bit mean on the day of surgery when they came in. We shoved the, the smokalyzer machine and got them to blow into it um, to, to be able to get these results. But again, absorbing this interaction within an existing conversation is just so powerful. Our outpatient clinic, so what I was talking about earlier where we have the, those kind of complex patients, um, we're getting quit rates at the six month mark of about 42%. And these are again biochemically verified. These type of patients are being seen weekly or fortnightly for around six months, if not a little bit longer. Um, the organisation completely funds their medication and the support. Um, but again, these are our high priority complex population, um, so for us, we stand to, to benefit as an organisation um, financially by supporting them to quit.
good news for smokers, this is a very busy slide. It pretty much just summarises our, our approach to supporting our, our staff to quit. So we had an approach back in 2011, we had a little form where the staff could fill it out and then they could go take it to the pharmacy and get some patches for a subsidised price. We had two staff members take it up in a year. It was a long form, it was complicated, it had multiple steps. So we thought, well, what are we going to do? Well, we actually asked our staff. So we got a group of staff together, focus group. We had it facilitated, uh, both smokers, ex-smokers and non-smokers, and said, hey, as an organisation, we care about your health. We also know that a healthier workforce improves patient care. And we also know that as an employer, a smoking employee costs us a whole lot of money. And there's some data from the US showing that's around three and a half thousand US dollars a year from increased absenteeism and from uh, loss of productivity due to smoking breaks. So for us, there was a threefold reason why we wanted to do this. So we got our staff together and they said, okay, well, we want access to pharmacotherapy and we want the organisation to pay for it. If we relapse, we want to continue to be supported. We want the opportunity to have individual consultations with a, with a tobacco treatment specialist. We want group consultations in pockets of the organisation where there's high smoking rates particularly our IT department um, and also uh, intensive care nursing for us was also a really big group of, of smokers. Uh, we want text, we want emails, we want a whole lot of different options to support because we're busy health professionals, we're busy people, um, that's what we'd like. So we introduced it. All they had to do was they had to email an email address with their name and then we got in touch from them, gave, gave them a call and worked out what was next step for them, what suited them to support them to quit. So what happened? Well, we had around 50% of staff who signed up quit, and actually our more recent figures now are at 62%. So this costs us a little bit of money as an organisation, um, but when we look at how much a smoking employee costs us um, and the longevity of that, um, for us it was a really smart move. And what we've found is that a whole lot of these staff have actually banded together. And when they've seen colleagues quit, they think, oh, well, I can do it as well. So for us, it was a really important part of our journey. Just like every health service, we struggle with what we call perimeter-based smoking. So you become smoke-free, you push everyone to the perimeter. So for us as a health service, big metro health service, big main road, whole lot of TV cameras always out the front covering stories, this was a really big issue for our executive. And it didn't fit with the brand that Alfred Health wanted to have. What was interesting, at the time, we actually did something to support our patients to quit. We saw an 85% reduction in people smoking around the perimeter. And the most recent audit that we've done, and, and this is a, one of the most uh, interesting parts of my job, is um, we count the number of people. We actually walk around the site and count the number of people smoking on a particular day every three months to, to get this kind of snapshot of observational survey. Um, but when we've done it most recently, the team and I only absor observed four patients in a nine-hour period out the front of our hospital. So we still struggle with visitors, but as far as staff and as far as patients, we've had a marked reduction in them standing out in front of the hospital having a cigarette. So what, what we've done here is, I suppose, have a continuous improvement focus. We had to have a definition of success that was beyond compliance. And again, that evidence of a problem does not mean it's a failure, it just means that we've got more work to do. Consistency is one I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, um, but certainly uh, an inconsistent approach within an organisation and within a unit is a, a whole lot of frustration for a patient. And when you think of a client and a patient, they're going to have most likely transitioned through various units within an organisation. So they might end up in the emergency department where, oh no, get, go out the front and have a cigarette smoke. Then they're an involuntary patient, no, you're not allowed. Then all of a sudden they're in the gen med unit because their, their, uh, their general health has deteriorated and there's different rules again. So what we know is that inconsistency and making exceptions, which are usually made from a good place, we think we're managing that situation the best we can at that point, um, can be a cause of aggression. We needed to ensure that our approach did not widen inequality. So we know that there are inequalities in smoking. We know particularly our mental health clients stand to bear the majority of the burden, both health and financial, attributable to smoking. So it was not okay for us as an organisation to have inequalities in quitting. So for us, we had to make sure in our mental health unit, we had 
the same support. We were giving them the same opportunity to quit as we were the general population. <laughs> Clinical leadership was important. It couldn't just be an oh and issue. And as I've said before, particularly in this area with our clinicians, a little bit of evidence, a little bit of the research, the literature, but plenty of emotion. So some of this has kind of already been highlighted in the earlier presentation, but I just want, wanted to touch on both smoking and quitting in, in mental health and the literature around that. So we know that the prevalence of smoking is consistently higher among people who use mental health settings. So we've got about a 17% smoking rate across Alfred Health. It's sitting at 75 within our mental health unit, so significantly higher. We also know that people with a mental health condition tend to smoke heavily and more intense, intensely, and we know that their health is disproportionately affected. We know that they tend to, uh, people who smoke tend to experience more severe symptoms of psychosis, depression and anxiety, have an increased risk of onset of panic attacks, an increased risk of dementia. They spend longer time in hospital and less time out. So for the patient, that quality of life, really important. And they require high doses of some medications, things like psychotropic medications and all of the metabolic effects that come with them. And we've heard earlier this morning, um, particularly around you know, diabetes and cardiovascular being so prominent around, among our mental health consumers. And a lot of these clients are now dying from their chronic disease and not their mental illness. So having to use higher doses of medicines that carry those adverse effects is contributing to that. What's the good news? Well, what, what do we know about quitting in people with mental health conditions? We know they, don't, they want to quit as much as the general population, but they lack the confidence in their ability to quit and they may be therefore less likely to make a quit attempt. So if we're, we're, I've got a patient in front of me and um, a, a story I've kind of told and one that resonates with me still now is that we had a four bed gen med unit uh, a ward um, at Alfred Health and there were four patients, three of which smoked. One lady was a 70-year-old lady who had COPD. We talked to her about smoking. We had another gentleman who was in his 40s. Uh, he'd had a cardiovascular event. We spoke to him about his smoking. And we had the 30-year-old patient who had an overdose attempt, um, was in a gen bed unit uh, with uh, a psych special at that point. Um, he was homeless. He had AOD use. And we didn't talk to him about smoking. He actually called the gen med physician on it and said, what makes it okay for you to decide whether or not I'm okay to quit? I'm not confident in doing it, but by you telling me I can't and I've got too much else happening, he's not doing anything to help me. I really wanted to capture his story. Um, he wouldn't give me consent to do so, but I think that's really powerful. We need to provide the same offer of support to everyone, regardless of why they're there. It's not up to us to make that call for them. We know that in quitting in people with a mental health condition upon quitting, they can experience increased life expectancy and improved physical health. Once they're through the nicotine withdrawal, they can experience things like reduced depression, anxiety and stress, and improved mood and quality of life, more disposable income. And so many of the clients I see spend the entire amount of their pension on, on cigarettes and dose reduction in medications. So smoke-free policies in mental health. Well, we know that these do challenge a long-standing smoking culture, but I think it, it's really interesting to, to start thinking about how smoke-free policies put tobacco on par with drugs and alcohol. And look, it's not, it's not straightforward. It requires substantial, cultural, practical and structural change. And it's an essential part of tobacco control generally, but it needs to be accompanied in a health service by nicotine dependency treatment pathways, staff training and education, and access to nicotine replacement therapy and associated pharmacotherapy. We know in the literature uh, that total smoke-free policies are more effective than partial. They provide consistency. They avoid the negative consequences of persistent nicotine withdrawal. They minimise fire risk and they minimise exposure to secondhand smoke. So what are the benefits in a, in a smoke-free mental health setting? Well, they, they do protect from exposure to secondhand smoke. There is no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. They protect from initiation into smoking and relapse. 
And we know that if we do well to clinically manage a patient's nicotine dependency during their inpatient stay, even if it's not about quitting, even if it's about managing their withdrawal, <coughs> we'll increase that client's chance of quitting. And the longer the admission, the higher the quit rate. It decreases readmission rates, so again, costs to health services and the health system, and it increases the chances of them making a subsequent quit attempt. We also know from the literature if we implement them well, they can decrease disruptions. And there's a couple of studies, particularly one in the Lancet last year, where there was a significant decrease in patient towards patient and patient towards staff violence uh, in a well-implemented uh, forensic mental health facility uh, where they, they were totally smoke-free. And the other part is better utilisation of staff time. How much time is spent negotiating smoking leave? The transaction of giving over the cigarettes or the lighter? Um, so certainly um, our staff at Alfred Health report that they've got so much more time now to actually talk to the patient about other aspect, aspects of their health and wellbeing. So the client that actually took us to VCAP works with us now on our approach to smoke free. <laughs> and she actually came up with this kind of terminology that resonates well in our mental health setting. And this is the wording that's used with our community mental health uh, settings with our case managers, so that this dialogue, this conversation around us being smoke-free starts way earlier than the patient arriving on the doorstep, um, either as a voluntary and involuntary patient. So if we are smoke-free, you have two choices. We're here to help you quit. Quitting is great for your health. This is a great opportunity to give it a go. If you decide to quit, we'll offer you information, support and encouragement. So we're not enforcing quitting, we're supporting quitting. But that's okay. It's okay if you just want help to cope with your withdrawal. If you decide to cope, we'll offer you support as well. So it's around that offer of support. We care about your health and this is what we're <coughs> going to do for you. So what does it mean for a health service when we're supporting people who smoke? Well, in some cases people will abstain temporarily. Some patients will take the opportunity to quit completely. But the offer of support immediately on a mission is so important. And that initial dialogue, that initial conversation might be around coping, especially when a patient may be stressed and overwhelmed, and it may lead to quitting smoking down the track. And for many patients, it's quite inevitable that they're going to experience a period of enforced abstinence. So providing that systematic support is going to help with that and to minimise withdrawal. This is kind of, you know, the summary that, that came out of our VCAT hearing um, was that patients should never be forced to experience nicotine withdrawal. Nicotine withdrawal symptoms, just like alcohol withdrawal symptoms, are predictable, they're preventable and they're treatable. And we know that we can do that with the combination of medicine and behavioural support, which is the most effective and most comfortable way. It needs to be used for the duration of a mission and you need to give it quickly. So quite often I'll hear clinicians say, I'll wait for a couple of days and then I'll have a chat to the patient about smoking. And a couple of days down the track, they're going to be well and truly in the midst of withdrawal. So have that conversation early around smoking from that aspect of coping and then work up to whether or not it might be appropriate uh, to introduce the concept of smoking cessation. I also wanted to touch on clinical aggression. This is very topical in Victoria. I'm sure you've all heard of the unfortunate incident where one of our cardiothoracic surgeons was assaulted talking to someone about smoking and unfortunately passed away. Uh, one of the things that we have done, and, and this was actually happening before that event happened, uh, and it ended up bigger than Ben-Hur, but effectively we wanted to try and understand what are the determinants of aggression. We're a large health service. We have about four episodes of clinical aggression or code grey within our general hospital uh, every day. Uh, we have a different protest for clinical aggression within mental health and within ED, so this data is, uh, is excluding those. But effectively, we, we retrospectively <coughs> audited 1,300 uh, medical records. If anyone that's ever done that, that's uh, really, really fun and takes a whole lot of time. But what we found was, was interesting that more than half of the patients involved in episodes of clinical aggression in the general part of the hospital smoked. So that's severely overrepresented when we think that only about 17% of our, our, we've got a 17% smoking prevalence. And then we looked at episodes of clinical aggression in what we called our highly dependent smokers. So those who are most likely to experience significant withdrawal. And for us that was 81 patients and 180 code grades. So they're having more than one episode of clinical aggression. Again, I was pleased to see we were prescribing nicotine replacement therapy, but the patients weren't taking it. 
And when we looked were they in withdrawal, and this was done by a uh, psych research nurse, the majority of the patients were in withdrawal. So for us this has been a really big opportunity and we're starting to talk to consumers and clients and we're starting to hear that people perceive nicotine replacement therapy to be a medicine for smoking cessation, not for a medicine around managing withdrawal. So we're looking at opportunities to improve the understanding within the workforce but also within our consumers and what type of advocacy roles Alfred Health could have in this space. Um, so we're in the middle of a logistic regression uh, model and we're hoping to be able to tease out from this that nicotine withdrawal is an independent predictor for clinical aggression. Now, as health services, we care about patient outcomes, we care about staff safety. Um, so if this is the case, we all have a very big opportunity um, and this is really a, a modifiable risk factor for clinical aggression, so, so stay tuned. Um, I just wanted for, for the last little bit to uh, go through why it's so hard to quit. Um, and I suppose one of the big things that we've got to remind ourselves that, that people who smoke aren't weak, nor are they simply making a bad lifestyle choice. There's a whole lot of reasons why they smoke. There's the dependency, but there's also the behaviour and the psychological connections that have, have developed over many, many years of smoking. Uh, nicotine dependence is a chronic medical condition, okay? It's actually in the DSM. There's actually an ICD code for it. So when health services say to me, oh, smoking isn't a clinical issue, well, it, it actually is. It, it's well, well and truly uh, documented that it is the case. We need to have an approach where we talk to people about smoking and we assess their dependence, just like we'd assess their blood pressure, their mental health, their cardiovascular disease, whatever it might be. We know it's under-recognised by health professionals, so many health services I visit in Victoria, smoking still sits in the social history in the medical record or it sits in the lifestyle section. It's actually a part of past medical history and we need to see it like that. Assessment's important. And this is the abbreviated Fagostrom or the heaviness of smoking index. And for us, when we looked at how we were going to measure dependence and assess dependence, we wanted to have the most simplest tool available. There's actually some data now showing that maybe time for first cigarette might be the most, uh, or the, the easiest and the best way uh, to look at, at understanding and assessing dependence. So again, we want to make this process easy for our clinicians to engage in. Um, it was quite interesting hearing some of the, uh, the quotes before from, from uh, your team. Um, and I think it's a, a, a misconception that exists still with clinicians, but definitely with consumers, around this idea that nicotine and having a cigarette will reduce stress, anxiety, and improve concentration, mood, and so forth. So for a second, I wanted us to think about what happens when people have a cigarette. So within about 30 seconds of a drag on a cigarette, nicotine will bind to what we call these acetylcholine receptors in the VTA area of the brain. That happens quickly. And because of that, the body responds by increasing dopamine, so one of the feel-good chemicals. So for the person who smokes, they're feeling a bit of what we call positive reinforcement. They're thinking, I'm picking up a cigarette, it's making me feel good, I want to keep doing it. But what we know is the biggest driver of why people continue to smoke is that this nicotine doesn't hang around long in the body, so it can't sit on these receptors for very long. So this dopamine doesn't hang around for very long and the levels start dropping. So what happens? Well, the opposite. You start to feel that your concentration decreases, that your mood might drop, that your stress might increase because you're in withdrawal. So what do you do? You have to pick up a cigarette and so it continues. So people do report that they feel within the first week or two of quitting smoking that there are changes in their mental health. But again, the literature and the clinical experience tells us that a couple of weeks, a couple of months down the track that they have significant improvement. So it's important that they understand, consumers understand what smoking is doing in their, in their brain. And there's a great, uh, a great little uh, video produced by um, the team over in New Zealand who are, who are doing amazing things in tobacco control. It's called The Little Green Monster and it's on YouTube. And um, it explains this beautifully. It's cartoons and it resonates really well with consumers. So that's a tool that I use a little bit within my, my practice with patients. I wanted to just quickly talk about nicotine withdrawal and how awful the symptoms are. So if we're not supporting patients, they can expect to experience things like dizziness, insomnia, restlessness, difficulty concentration, concentrating, irritability, mood changes. And if you're a client with mental illness, you're going to be experiencing some of those symptoms as well. So, so withdrawal is going to exacerbate them. 
The duration and severity is so different from person to person, but we know that these symptoms peak day one and two. So again, it's just about us having these conversations as early as possible. We know that these nicotine withdrawal symptoms usually are alleviated within about a two to four week period. Uh, and we know that when we look at withdrawal, there's kind of two types of, of cravings that people will report. We report. They report background or general cravings for smoke. So these kind of fluctuate throughout the day and will gradually disappear. Um, but for a lot of people, there'll be two specific cravings, having a cup of coffee, talking on the phone to their mum, that's one I hear all the time, um, or uh, you know, being in a social situation. And these arise in response to stimuli. They're fast onset, they're intense, and they're short-lived. So when we look at how we treat these nicotine withdrawal symptoms, we use a nicotine patch for the background cravings, and we use one of the what we call intermittent products for these two induced cravings. So what, what can we do as health professionals? I think we've got to remind ourselves that we still are the greatest external trigger to prompting a quit attempt, replicated time and time again by many, many studies. And we also know that not advising may be worse than useless. So this is some data from the UK. It's in the primary care or GP setting, uh, and it resonates really well with clinicians. But effectively, if a patient didn't see a GP, they've got what we call an odds ratio of one. So kind of consider that, that as a baseline for how likely they are to quit. But if they, a patient saw their GP and their GP knew they smoked and said nothing about their smoking, they're statistically significantly less likely to quit smoking than had they had not seen that GP at all. You ask them why? Oh, doctor knows I smoke. If it was an issue, they would have told me. Mustn't be related to whatever. Where the GP advised said you really should quit smoking, didn't offer any help, uh, only slight difference between not having seen a GP at all. You ask them why? I know I shouldn't smoke, I don't know how to quit. Try to quit eight times, 10 times, 20 times before. What happens when you offer help? <coughs> Statistically significant, more likely to make a quit attempt. So I just challenge clinicians within your health, within your practice to think about, do you have a checkbox system? Do you smoke? Yes. How much? Do you drink? Yes. How much? If there's no response to that, what are we telling that patient in front of us? The best practice in smoking cessation is using a combination of medicine and behavioural support together. And we know that that works in a wide range of settings and populations. And as health professionals, why would we encourage people to do anything but best practice? So we have to encourage people to use both. Medicines available in Australia to support people to quit smoking, three. Important to remember, we don't do it well, they're going to be less likely to want to use it again. We don't have a whole lot of drugs in our arsenal to be able to support people to quit smoking. So if we're going to use them, we need to use them in accordance with best practice with the appropriate advice. So NRT, uh, and the easiest way kind of I explain this to people, is that it's a little bit like a cold and flu tablet. Takes the edge off, <coughs> makes you feel a bit more comfortable, helps you to get on with your day. So it's not going to give the same effect as a cigarette. It really just reduces motivation to smoke and minimises the severity of withdrawal symptoms. There's six forms available in Australia. I've said before we've got what we call the patches, which is for your background cravings, and your intermittent products, which are for your Q-induced cravings. We know they're efficacious. We know that they're safe. But patients need to use them for long enough, so a minimum of eight weeks, together with behavioural support. Now, this is often where things fall down with patients. So as clinicians, we need to explain to our clients what best practice looks like and how to get the most out of these medicines. Um, I know uh, in the interest of time, I, I don't have much longer. I can see Lorena timing me down the front. Um, but this is um, a pharmacokinetic graph. I am a pharmacist. So I'm a little bit of a nerd by nature. And I, I use this a lot when I'm talking to particularly emergency department physicians and emergency department staff. Um, because they'll often say to me, Emma, I don't understand the patients out in front of the hospital having a cigarette. They've got a patch on. And I say, oh, well, how long's the patch been on? Oh, maybe an hour. And I show them this and say, the patch is pretty much going to do nothing for the first six to eight hours. Okay? You're putting it on the skin. It takes time to reach what we call steady state. So imagine a patient being in acute pain and us offering them a patch for their pain. We wouldn't do it. So we can't do it when we're looking at acute withdrawal. So the pink line's a cigarette. So you can see soon after having a puff on a ciggy, uh, you get high levels of nicotine quite quickly. None of the other products on the market deliver nicotine anywhere near as quickly as a cigarette. So if your client, your consumer, thinks it's going to work in the same way, 
well, they're going to be bitterly disappointed. And it's quite interesting when you guys talked about, you know, that, that the patients found that the, um, you know, the the distraction or the sensory type of modulation for them was was what that what resonated with them to help. And, and I wonder whether they're using these products enough. They're using a high enough dose frequently enough, and, and know what to expect from them to be able to, to articulate whether or not they're helping. Um, combination therapy is gold standard now. So I'm not sure what's, what's being used within your settings, uh, hopefully or in the new version of the RACGP guidelines, which will be applicable beyond the general practice <laughs> setting. Uh, uh, so they'll kind of become the, the inadvertent Australian guideline for smoking cessation, uh, will be recommending combination therapy in line with the evidence. So it's basically a patch plus an intermittent product together. The patch is your background product, and the intermittent product is giving that, that quick and more flexible relief. So the two together uh, increases efficacy, increases patient comfort, reduces withdrawal, and also the patient is not likely to experience any more side effects. So it's actually been around for decades overseas. When I worked in the UK in 2005, we were doing it. There's so many health services, certainly in Victoria, still just giving everyone a touch. Uh, misconceptions are really big. Generally, it leads to inadequate dose. Generally, people will be underdosed. Um, and I am going to end with drug interactions. Um, so I think this is something, particularly within mental health, that's really important to understand. So that we know that there are chemicals in tobacco smoke that interact with medicines. Now, the simplest way to explain what we call pharmacokinetic interactions is essentially there are chemicals in tobacco smoke. When you have a drag on a cigarette, they speed up your liver. And your liver has these enzymes in it. And because the liver's sped up and these enzymes are sped up, they will break down drugs like clozapine, olanzapine, chlorpromazine much quicker. So smokers need higher doses of clozapine, olanzapine and chlorpromazine than non-smokers. So if they quit smoking, the opposite is the case. The liver no longer works as quickly, the enzymes are no longer working as quickly, and patients will need a dose reduction. Now that can be a really big bargaining chip for patients. I had a patient quit smoking because we couldn't push his clozapine dose any higher without him getting significant postural drop. So he quit smoking, we reduced his clozapine dose by 40%, and his metabolic profile changed substantially as well. He actually went from being on insulin back onto being oral hyperglycemic agents. And for him, that was just absolutely massive. So these interactions are beneficial not only to the patient, because we want patients to be on the lowest possible dose, particularly antipsychotic drugs that affect metabolic profile, but for the patient, that can be a really big bargaining chip as well. And we also know there's what we call pharmacodynamic dynamic interactions, where essentially the cigarette smoking is doing the opposite to what the drug's trying to do. So beta blockers, insulin, benzos, even methadone are some examples there. So again, it's just an important consideration, and I think when patients are going uh, from being uh, not allowed to smoke, allowed to smoke, not allowed to smoke, allowed to smoke, that's going to wreak havoc with their medication. So the consistent approach uh, is much better for stabilising their medication, particularly those patients on olanzapine and clozapine. Um, my details are there. Um, much of my work, certainly in Victoria, is supporting the, uh, the health services across the state, um, but I'm more than happy to, to share um, you know, anything with you guys as well, answer any questions, put you in touch with, with other people who've got different models um, in Victoria. So feel free at any point to uh, send me an email. That's it from me. Thank you, Emma. Um, we now have some time for questions. So I'm going to put the VC people on the spot since they've been awfully quiet. Um, first up, is there any questions from anybody on VC? I think we've got Bentley, Geraldton, and Bunbury. For any of our speakers? Um, Hello, it's Jenny Payet from Bunbury. Um, oh. I'm in awe of what you've managed to do in the mental health setting. Can you take yourself setting. off this, Bunbury? <laughs> Still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can take here, I think. No? <laughs> we can see you, but we can't hear you. Sorry. Can you hear? Me? Okay. Um, 
not tech minded, so I'm not quite sure, sure how to fix that problem. Look, we might start in the room. Maybe your question will be asked by somebody in the room, and that might um, might help get you the answer. Any questions from anyone in the audience? Yeah, one for Emma. Yep. Do you see any role for e-cigarettes at all? Because they seem to be demonised a bit with the whole getting people off smoking. Yep. I had a, a partner who smoked for 25 years, and she used these cigarettes and, and had to touch the cigarette now for over two years. Yeah. Um, so just for, for those of you on VC, in case you didn't hear the question, um, I remember to repeat the question today. It's only taken me three days. But um, the question was around the role of e-cigarettes. Um, look, I think at the moment, um, certainly in Victoria, e-cigarettes are, um, are not used on health service sites, so we kind of you know, put them in the same basket as tobacco. Um, there certainly isn't the evidence to support that they're uh, helpful for cessation yet. Um, there's certainly no data as yet around the long-term safety effects with them. Um, we have had clients uh, that I have seen where the devices have exploded and they have ended up with significant burns to their body. Um, and again, it's because these products aren't regulated, not even from a consumer perspective, so we don't know, you know where they're made, how they're made and so forth. Um, but I'm not going to lie, I've had clients use them and have found them helpful. I just make sure that as a clinician, um, I'm not comfortable recommending them because I don't have that efficacy and safety data, um, but people do use them and find them helpful. I just make sure they're very much aware, you know, the, what, what's unknown in that space at the moment. So um, it'll be interesting the next few years, you know, what, what happens certainly, you know, across the country and, and also within the states in that space. Can I say, Emma, um, we recommend, because the drug and alcohol nurses have done, like Colin Mendelson, who is that tobacco addiction specialist, so I must admit we do recommend, like, for patients they can look on his website because he does have a lot of information about electronic cigarettes mm -hmm. and some of the companies that do supply the ele and sort of all that information that goes with yep. it. Yep. Yeah, um, Ken's also on the expert advisory group yeah. with myself. Um, there's a lot of discussion around them. He is quite pro. Um, I'm, I'm pro where the evidence is at at the moment, and I don't feel that there's enough there that as a clinician that I'm comfortable. Um, but certainly, there's, there's, it's a dividing, you know, perspective among clinicians, um, and particularly those who work in in DNA um, and are, are comfortable, you know, around harm reduction and so forth, are, are more comfortable there. So, yeah. It's hard for health professionals. There is that position statement that the NHMRC has put out which can help guide because there is, I mean, WA, it's, it's contraband. Yeah. I think um, also the position from the UK that said that they're 95% safer than smoking was, was a group of 14 experts coming together um, who came up with that figure. So just bear that in mind as well. Yeah. I think you had your hand up. I was going to ask the same thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> everyone else. I should actually put a slide on it because everyone asks about e-cigarettes. Yeah. Amy. Uh, what brief interventions did you use in your yep. hospital and who delivers those? Yeah, so we have uh, a statewide model. Uh, it's called the ABCD. So, I'm oh, so, oh, sorry, forgot to repeat the question. Um, what model of brief intervention, who delivers them and kind of what's incorporated as part of it? Um, so we have a statewide model, it's called the ABCD approach uh, within health services, A being asked, B being briefly intervened, and C being communicate back to primary care providers at the point of discharge. So as part of that brief intervention, um, it includes verbal advice to quit, that's emotionally salient, relevant to that person at that point in the bed. So it might be around wound healing, it might be around uh, cardiovascular health. Um, they're pro all provided with written resources, so they actually sit on the wards. They're provided with pharmacotherapy and referrals for behavioural support. So whether that be the Victorian Quit Line, uh, our smoke-free outpatient service or community smoking cessation clinics. So that's part of the, the model that we use. Um, it's delivered by pharmacists. Um, but it's also supported by the nursing staff throughout the organisation. The model we have, Bendigo Health uses a nurse-led model. So there's various, the, the ABC model stays the same, but the delivery of it changes depending on the individual health service. So it's available on, if you're interested in seeing what it looks like. It's on the startthe.conversation.org.au website. So there's a couple of resources produced by the Alfred Health on behalf of the Victorian government that sit on that website. And that's just easy to follow. You don't have to be trained. Yeah, yeah. So well, that, it's mm. part of the, the model is tr we give training to all our staff on smoking. Um, so for our nursing staff, the training for that sits within the learning module. 
uh, for the training for our pharmacists is all done face to face because we've only got a workforce of you know 250, 300 pharmacists. Um, so there's training that accompanies it, but the type of training is different depending on the discipline. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of Victoria has online uh, ABC training. They do. Yeah. Yeah, we wrote it with them. <laughs> So there'll actually be um, a new, there's some new modules coming out. Um, my colleagues were just there yesterday finishing them off. Um, so yeah, so yeah, Quick Victoria does have uh, online training um, that has various modules um, and the clinical components of that we've, we've, uh, we've written for them. So um, again, it, it's, I suppose, you know, in Victoria we're very lucky we have the collaboration between the Department of Health and Human Services who fund Alfred Health. Um, a small amount of money every year to have a peer leadership role among the other 86 health services across the state um, and we work together with the Peak Tobacco Control Body, um, our Heart, Heart Foundation, also Big Health and also Vacho around our Aboriginal communities as well. So we've got quite a good collaboration uh, within the state. And is that online training available outside of Victoria? So could we access it? I, yeah, it's not, it's not live yet but I could not understand why that wouldn't be the case yet. We've just started doing a trial at East Metro out at Armadale Hospital with the ABCD program. It's been really fantastic. Yeah. yeah. But just for those of you on VC at Armadale Hospital, they've um, they've been uh, done a trial of ABCD, a bit of a pilot, and they've had some great results as well. So.